Okay, so we've talked about the general principles of, of adverse selection or hidden knowledge and moral hazard or hidden action. Um, and we've seen how that's applied to just all sorts of general policy principles. But I now want to apply this more um, to a firm specifically and how firms are structured and why this, this idea of hidden knowledge and, and hidden action is actually an issue for firms that they have to grapple with. Um, and the reason why is because um, you have all sorts of delegation issues. If you remember the organizational chart we've been talking about, we have a board of directors that talks to a manager, the manager talks to the workers, and then they communicate back up that chain. Um, every level of that chain has some sort of hidden knowledge and hidden action. So there's built in um, adverse selection and moral hazard at each of those levels. And kind of the more general uh, term for this is something called a principal agent problem, um, where a principal is somebody who wants something done and the agent is the person who gets told what to do. So a principal will tell an agent to go do something. So in the case of this organization chart, we have a board of directors is a principal, tells the manager to do something, and the manager is the agent. And then at the next level, you have the manager tells the workers to do something. So the manager is the principal, and the workers are the agent. So it's this relationship between somebody wanting something and telling somebody to do it. But an issue with this principal agent problem is um, it's really hard to make sure that the agent does what the principal wants to do. A principal will give an agent authority, autonomy, and discretion to do something for them. Um, but then the principal doesn't have the ability to make sure that the agent does it. They lack this information. This is the hidden knowledge side. This is the adverse selection side. And often, the agent's preferences don't always align with the principal's preferences. You might have an employee and you say, I want you to do this thing for me. And they'll say, sure, but I have other ideas. And that can cause problems. That's why I had you read this fun article about this Customs and Border Patrol employee back from 2009, 2010, um, where she was, she was one of the, the border guards responsible for monitoring um, drug activity on the US-Mexico border. But she was also working for the cartels um, because her own preferences were to get money and not just protect the border from drug importation. And so there was, an, there was a, a misalignment of preferences between this employee and the board of directors and the manager um, because she wanted other things. And it was really hard to find this. And she was actually part of a larger sting with Customs and Border Patrol and um, ICE and other government agencies working along the border um, because um, it's really hard to monitor everything that's happening. We see the same thing right now with policing in the United States. In theory, police are an agent that are or agents that are given authority from some sort of governmental unit or society in general to enforce laws and to protect people. Um, but then they have their own preferences and they can implement that however they want. And it's really hard to monitor that. And it's really hard to enforce that. And if there are any issues with um, bad actors in the police, it is impossible to kind of remedy that. Um, which is why we've had movements for abolishing the police, um, just getting rid of that principal agent problem and making new agential relationships. And um, instead of having police cover everything, um, have um, specific organizations within a government or within a community focus on mental health or focus on community service or focus on other aspects instead of having police that are more kind of distantly um, position from the principal, which means they're more shielded from consequences, which causes all sorts of adverse selection and um, moral hazard issues, um, which is which is partially why we are in the situation we are right now with um, the ongoing protests. Um, so this table here comes from um, ESPP. It just shows a whole bunch of different principal agent problems. These things exist everywhere. Um, in the world, you have employers and employees. That's kind of the main thing we care about for this um, unit, um, where you are in theory, um, you will all be managers or employers. Um, bankers lend money to borrowers, but then that's a principal agent problem. The banker has to hope that the borrower does the right thing and pays the loan back. Um, you have owners and managers, landlords and tenants. Um, a landlord rents out their property to a tenant and then they have to hope that the tenant does the right thing and 
keeps it clean and keeps it well taken care of. Um, and that's the principal agent relationship there. Insurance companies, insured people. Um, you also have parents and teachers um, where if you're a parent, you essentially give a charge to your children's teachers to say you should teach them these things and hopefully you're doing it right. Um, you also have a parent-child relationship once you get to care in old age. Um, elderly parents say you are now in charge of, of helping manage my resources and finances and helping me um, manage health and other things. Um, and they have to hope that the children do the right thing and kind of help them through that. Um, and so you've, get, you've got all these different types of relationships here um, that you have to pay attention to because the preferences can be mis misaligned at each of these different levels between parents and, inter parents and children or parents and teachers or owners and managers. Um, you'll have all sorts of adverse selection issues and um, uh, moral hazard issues. So you have to figure out the best way to deal with those. Um, so if we go back to our organizational chart here, we have a board of directors, we have a manager, and we have workers. So the board, they have their own preferences. They benefit from the profits of the organizations. They're, they're the shareholders. They want the, the firm to make lots of money for them. Um, the manager gets no direct benefit from the profits um, in most organizations. It's not like if the, if the company doubles in size and doubles in their profits one year, the manager's still just going to get whatever their salary is. And so the incentive for that manager to double the organization's um, assets in one year isn't really strong. And so the board wants that to happen, but then the manager is not necessarily going to do it. And so you have this principal agent problem where you have misaligned incentives and misaligned preferences here. It also works at this next level. Um, workers are not constantly monitored, but the manager, in order to perform well and keep their job, they need to ensure high quality effort. And so how does this work? Um, how does a manager make sure that all the workers are doing what they're supposed to do? Um, and how does the board make sure that the manager is maximizing profits, um, even though the manager is not getting direct benefit from that, um, which is a tricky situation. And throughout all of this, you have adverse selection issues and moral hazard issues where workers, because they're not being monitored, could do whatever they want. Um, and board the owners, they talk to the manager, but they have to hope that everything's working. Um, and so how do you fix this? Um, according to your reading in Economy, Society, and Public Policy, the main answer here is contracts, um, where you essentially legally bind these different levels of people um, or informally do it through some sort of understanding where you say, here are all of the things that the agent must do to make the principal happy, basically. Um, to live up to the, the principal's standards and the principal's preferences. These are all the things the agent must do. Um, a more formal definition is it's a temporary or limited transfer of authority in labor markets, um, where basically you, you're a manager or a boss and you say, you must do these things for me. I'm giving you the ability to do this stuff for me. Do it or else there will be consequences. And there, there's this contract idea. And so while this is great in this kind of utopian society where you just sign a contract, you get employed by some organization, you say, I will do all of these things and then check the box and sign it and you're good. Um, in real life, this actually gets really hard because contracts are inherently incomplete. You cannot write a full employment contract that includes every single provision of every single thing that somebody must do. Um, also, the relationship that you have between manager and employer um, or employee is inherently asymmetric. Um, the people with more power will want more stuff out of you um, and they'll have higher expectations. And so you like there's also the natural inclination to take advantage of people lower down the chain. And so that causes um, more uh, moral hazard issues. Um, also, the tasks that you write down in a contract are inherently unknown. Um, if you get a job as um, a creative director in an organization, for instance, um, 
you will not have it written down in your contract that you must be an expert in Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator and you must spend your days from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. doing stuff in Photoshop and 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. doing stuff um, with Illustrator and you must do these specific things because the job is naturally going to evolve. First of all, um, you cannot be that specific um, because again, there's no flexibility. The firm's not going to be very efficient. They're going to spend all of their time writing down perfect contracts, which is going to be impossible. And so often you get hired for one specific thing and then that, that um, responsibility that you have um, starts shifting over time and it evolves and you start doing other stuff. Um, and that's because that's just the nature of how firms work. Um, again, like we talked about in the, in the, the section on firms here, um, firms are essentially little mini dictatorships where you have a manager and the owner is saying, you should do this. Um, and so for a firm to be effective, they need to have the flexibility to move people around to different tasks, which is tricky because then that could violate the contract that they have of this, this principal agent relationship where the agent is supposed to act in the interest of the principal or the firm. Um, and so you have to lay that out so they actually do it. But if you have it too broad, then there can be all sorts of moral hazard issues. Um, also, tasks are difficult to measure. Um, back in like medieval times, when you had like guilds working on specific products, like you had carpet makers and you had carpenters and you had other like exact um, firms and guilds that were creating things, you could pay workers based on how much stuff they created, um, how many feet of carpet were generated or how many um, bales of hay were created or whatever. And so this is called piece rate payment. Um, where you can pay your agents according to what they actually do and what they create. Um, and that is one way of, of, of contracting this out well. You say, I will pay you per unit of thing that you make, and I will um, you go figure out the best way to make as many things as you want. And then that helps um, solidify the agent principal relationship because the agent is going to do what the principal wants because they want to maximize how much money they get. Um, but in jobs like modern jobs today, if you are a nonprofit executive director, um, it's going to be really hard to get your volunteers and your employees to be paid based on some piece rate um, pay. Um, how are you going, like, I, I guess you could pay people like per grant that they, they receive if you, if you hire like a grant writer for a nonprofit. Um, but if you're working in like a, a parks department or some uh, state office for economic development, you're not paying people per email that they send. You're not paying people per meeting that they attend or anything like that. You're just paying people for their expertise. And so you can't use that, that lever of payment to make it so that that principal agent problem is strong. Um, and so you can't use that. You, you can't completely delineate all of those contracted relationships there just because of the nature of the job. And so that gets, that gets really tricky from a management perspective. So amidst all of that, workers will still work. Even though you're not paying grant managers per grant and you're not paying employees per email and doing a piece rate thing, people still work and they still um, put forth effort, even though contracts are incomplete. And so why is that? Um, there's a whole host of reasons. People have, like, PhD people study this stuff um, to see why people care about work and why they actually do it. Um, part of it is there's just a general norm of working. Um, there's kind of, it's, it's an informal institution where you're taught um, in school that um, you should work. And there's benefit to working and um, uh, there's dignity found in working. Um, government policies are set up in a way that makes it so you have to work to get extra benefits, to, to get unemployment benefits. You have to be like actively searching for a job. Um, we kind of have this norm in the United States of work is important. Um, often it's taken to the extreme of work is extremely important. You must always check your email constantly and um, maximize your working time. But that comes from these norms of, of, of placing importance on work. Um, 
workers also just feel a feeling of responsibility. Um, they they find benefit in, in working. They like um, helping people. They, they, they get utility from performing work. Um, there's actually a, a cool phenomenon specifically in the public service world um, called public service motivation, or in general, it's this notion of calling. Um, which is not just public service motivation, but all sorts of sectors, where people feel called to specific jobs. And it's not like a religious, spiritual calling. Um, it's more like they just feel deep down inside that they should do a specific job. Um, so a colleague of mine back at Brigham Young University, when I taught there, he studied um, why zookeepers care, like why zookeepers become zookeepers because it's actually kind of not the greatest, most glamorous job. Um, you spend lots of your time like scooping up poop and um, dealing with animals who are sick and dealing with just like gross smells all the time. Um, and in his interviews with zookeepers, he found that most like the happiest zookeepers were the ones who said that they felt called to be zookeepers. They felt a deep connection with the animals and they felt like they had to, like that, that was their life's mission to work with animals and to um, encourage conservation efforts and to do other things um, that zookeepers do. They felt called to that. And so they were willing to forego extra money. Um, they could open up their own private practice um, veterinarian shop or something, um, but instead they, they gave that up to become a zookeeper because they felt called to do so. Um, in the public sector, we have the same idea where lots of people who work in the public sector have this thing called public service motivation, where they're just motivated to not be entrepreneurs and not like work in the private sector, but they're, they feel kind of a calling to work for the public sector and to make the world a better place through public service or through the nonprofit sector. Um, many of you are in an MPA and an MPP degree because you feel public service motivation. You're motivated to work for the public sector. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. Um, that's why I did not get an MBA and go to the business and finance world. I have no desire to do that. Um, I'd much rather like improve the world through nonprofits and governments. And um, that's just because of however my preferences are lined up in my head. I have... I feel motivated for public service, and I like that. Um, and so I work for that. Um, and you all do too, because you're in this class. Um, but this is kind of a broader, um, more loosey-goosey, harder thing to under, like harder thing to model mathematically. So economists boil all of this stuff down into one specific reason why people still work. And that idea is that um, it's basically people work because they're afraid of getting fired and they're afraid of losing their job. And so for economists, fear is what keeps people in line um, rather than like motivation and calling and responsibility and things like that. Um, and this is the model that you saw in chapter six of Economy, Society, and Public Policy. This is the game theoretic model that you saw. Um, the, the logic behind it, we're not gonna talk about any of the math or the graphs or anything that's not important. What's really important is the logic here. So the logic here is that employers can't directly monitor their employees um, because of um, like you cannot actually look at every single person and see what they're all doing. So the way you make sure that they do the right thing is you increase the cost of job loss. Um, and so make it so the employers, the employees want to keep their jobs because it is too expensive and too scary out in the world not having that job. Um, so their goal is to make it so that it is costly and hard and difficult for you to leave. Um, that's the, the mathy principle here. Um, so what this is called is employment rent. And we'll talk about what rent actually means on the next slide here. But essentially, it, like the more benefit you get from having a job, um, the larger the cost of losing the job is. And so you work more to avoid losing that to avoid losing that rent because the, the cost of losing your job is too high. So this idea of an economic rent or this job rent here is you essentially add up all of the benefits of having a job, including the opportunity costs. You subtract the costs of having that job or all of the negative aspects of it. And whatever is left is your employment rent. And if that's high, you're going to keep working because you want to maximize that rent. You want to 
have lots of benefit. This gets really confusing, this, this term of rent, because it has nothing to do with like the rent that you pay for an apartment or the rent that you pay, like if you go to Home Depot and rent a fancy digger thing, it's not that type of rent. Um, this specific type of rent in economics is really just benefits minus costs. And that's, that's the general benefit you get from something. And um, we'll talk about rents later in the semester when we talk about like rent seeking, um, where organizations and firms will try to maximize their profits and maximize um, government contracts and maximize other things that give them extra benefits. So rents are just kind of like bonus points or benefit points or not happiness points because they're actually measurable. But it's just kind of the extra, the extra bonus that you get from um, working hard or having a good job or other things like that. So the example that we had in the, the, S, the ESPP reading here is you have Maria here who's earning $12 an hour. That is not the total benefit of her job. Um, like she's getting $12 an hour, but if she lost her job, um, she would get unemployment benefits. Um, she would get $6 an hour while searching for a job. And so what that means is she's left with kind of $6 in net benefit from having her job. Um, and so that is the, the total benefit here. It includes the opportunity cost, the unemployment benefit, um, but that's her $6 here. That's the benefit she gets from working. But there are al there's also disutility that comes from working. Um, which in the book example here is this $2 an hour thing. So for her to work, she's also losing some benefit. Like this, this is more kind of along the utility idea where it's not super measurable. Um, this is like if, if she had like stinky uh, coworkers who used microwaves to um, cook fish or something, that causes disutility in work. If she faces... Um, racism or um, structural sexism issues or other like serious issues in in the workplace that causes disutility anything that makes work a bad place for you causes disutility um, and so here if she lost that job she would suddenly gain that back um, because she's not losing two dollars of benefit or two dollars of her time however she's valuing that because she can leave she can leave the the, the unkind coworkers. She can leave um, a, a sexist or racist environment. She can leave um, whatever is causing that disutility. And so if you take the benefits of her job, so she's getting $6 in benefit from being there. Um, if you subtract the $2 disutility, that means her rent that she's getting, the bonus points she's getting is $4 an hour. And so as long, like that's positive. So she's going to keep working because she's going to lose $4 uh, in total if she loses the job um, because she'll suddenly um, only get $6 in income instead of 12. Um, she'll gain $2 because she will lose that disutility, but then she'll end up only with four. And so why this is important is if you are her employer and you can sum, like, again, these are made up numbers except for the income and the unemployment benefit, you can't actually measure disutility. Um, but you can, like, disutility still works in this equation. So if you um, are an employer and you see that lots of people are leaving their jobs um, and kind of quitting, that could be because of one of two reasons. It could be that the benefits aren't high enough to keep the, the employment rent high um, because people are leaving. Once this gets down to negative or to zero, people are going to leave the job. So if the benefits aren't high enough, people are going to start leaving. Or if the disutility is too high, people are going to start leaving. So if you want to boost this, if you raised the wage from $12 an hour to like $16 an hour, that changes the math. And now the, the total employment rent would be $8 an hour and she would stay employed. Um, if you could remove the disutility of working and make it a more welcoming place um, and make it so she's not losing $2 of her time, um, because of um, a, a bad environment or because of unkind coworkers or whatever, um, then that will also change this rent here. Um, the other variable you can mess with is the unemployment benefit. If that increases um, up to like $10 an hour while she's searching for a job, 
that would actually change the calculation completely. So if we left 12, for instance, let's erase all of this here. So let's say she's earning $12 an hour and the unemployment benefit is $10 an hour that she would get if she quit and just started looking for a job. So that means her benefit from working is, is $2 an hour. She would lose $2 if she quit. Um, the cost of her job, this disutility that she's getting, is also $2, which means she breaks even. She doesn't have any employment rent. The benefits don't outweigh the costs anymore, and so she has no incentive to keep working um, if the unemployment benefit goes up high. So if the manager really wants to keep her, if unemployment benefits go up higher, um, the manager needs to either raise her wage or make the workplace a better, welcoming, happier environment so that she stays. Um, and this happens in real life. So in, April, in March and April of 2020, um, while Congress was debating um, how much to um, increase unemployment benefits because of COVID-19 and the economic shutdown that followed, um, many politicians actually said, if we raise unemployment benefits too high, people will stop working um, and they will just rely on the unemployment benefits. And that is true according to this model. If, these, if this goes up high and she's not earning a ton of money and she's getting lots of disutility from working there, it is completely logical for her to stop working and rely on the unemployment benefit and find another job because of the way the numbers are. But really, that's not her fault. That's not a moral failing for her because she's now going to just quit her job and rely on unemployment. That really, in this situation, um, the two variables that you have here, the wage income and the disutility of working, most of that responsibility falls on the firm. Um, if she stops because un unemployment benefit goes up high and she quits her job, that's a sign that either her wage is too low because now it's not worth it for her to stay, or the disutility is high. The job stinks. And so naturally, like the, the logical, rational thing to do is for her to quit. And so while politicians were saying like, oh no, people are gonna stop working, it's not because they're being lazy, it's because firms are not paying them enough and it's because the jobs aren't great. Um, and so naturally people are going to quit um, because they're going to maximize their employment benefit. They're going to maximize their rent. They're going to go somewhere where they get more benefit of, from their situation here. And so that's why we care about this in policy. Um, when there are debates, anytime there's a debate about raising the minimum wage or raising unemployment benefits, um, there's always fear that people will stop working. And it's not necessarily because people want to just stop working completely. Um, as we saw previously, lots of people feel called to specific jobs or they, they get personal benefit from working. Um, there's just a general norm in the United States to work. And so it's not that people are being lazy. It's that um, as soon as unemployment benefits go up, if the wages are low and if the job stinks, of course people are going to leave. Um, so to fix that, either raise the wages or make the jobs less sucky and then people will stay um, because they don't want to they want to maximize their their employment rent there um, so that's that's the way this works and that's the way it gets implemented with with policy situations here the way this works with the management side making it so that workers work more um, when they're afraid of getting fired um, follows this game so this is a game theory game we could we could write it out as kind of a two by two matrix um, but we're not going to worry about that because we're beyond that. You know what Pareto efficiency and Nash equilibriums are. So in this game, the employer chooses some wage, like $12 an hour. And then if the worker works hard enough, they get to keep the job at that wage. So with Maria, their, her boss says, I'm going to pay you $12 an hour. So Maria is going to work up to $12 an hour of, of work so she can keep that job. The worker chooses some level of effort, how hard they're going to work, and they will also be strategic. They're going to say, I could work, I could give like 100% of my time and effort to this job, but I don't actually need to do that because maybe it's not the greatest job in the world. Um, I could give like 70% effort and kind of just um, not be super committed to the job because I don't need to be um, and still maintain that job. 
And so the game here is this tension between the employer having some sort of wage and the worker choosing the level of effort for it. Um, in general, the payoffs help determine this here. So if the employer wants super high levels of effort, you could pay somebody like $1,000 an hour um, and make it contingent on them being like super effective and super efficient, and they would work really hard. That would improve their, their labor and their effort a ton. But that's probably excess of what you need to pay them. Um, for the worker, what you end up getting, what the payoff is, is you get money and you have to trade your time for that money. And so you're going to choose the best level of effort that maximizes your time and your money here. And then ESPP, you saw all sorts of indifference curves and budget lines and, and ISO cost curves. And you don't need to worry about that for this class. Um, what really matters here is as these employers and employees are deciding how much to pay and how much effort to give, um, they're looking at two different things. Um, the employees, we go the employer so the employees are looking at their employment rent this is what they care about the most and this is the benefit that they're getting and so this is back to the maria example of um how much disutility they have how much money they could make if they weren't in that job um, and so that's where they're deciding and so if you want to boost their payoffs you pay them more money and then that raises their rent and then that means they're going to work more um, from the firm side they're constrained by profit they could pay all of their workers like a billion dollars a year and they'd get lots of effort from that, but that's going to hurt their profit. And so in, firms have every incentive to pay as low as possible um, so that they don't have to overpay their employees for some level of effort. And so that's what ends up happening is you get this, this kind of dance between the two um, where you have firms trying to pay as little as possible and workers trying to also work as little as possible within the, the level of payment they're getting. And so if you want them to work more, you pay them more, and then they're afraid of losing that job because they don't want to lose that employment rent, and so they keep working, and that's this idea of fear determining how much you work. Um, how, how realistic this is and how reflective it is in real life, I'm not sure. It's a helpful model of thinking of, of how this works, but in most situations, like, unless it's something where like I get paid $10 to mow somebody's lawn, um, I'm not gonna expend tons of effort there. But in like the job I have, or even as like a PhD student, um, I'm earning more now as a, as a professor than I was as a PhD student, but I'm like working the same amount. Um, and so like the wage is different now, um, but my effort is still the same. Um, and so it, it, it's not, super universally applicable this this model of this labor discipline thing um, because people are driven by other motivations than fear if we were 100 percent driven by fear and not wanting to lose a job then this explains things great um, but we're motivated by other things by callings by public service motivation by feelings of responsibility other things like that and that goes beyond fear here and so um, it's it's not perfect but it is it is important and it actually does, on average, fit within um, how the economy works. So the uh, Federal Reserve actually cares about this. So if you remember, we've talked briefly about the things that the Fed cares about. It cares about inflation. It wants to keep inflation at like 2 to 3%-ish. And it also cares about employment or unemployment. It wants to keep unemployment low. But the goal for the Fed is not to have 0% unemployment because that actually means you have a less efficient economy. You have people who are afraid to leave their jobs completely and nobody's gonna move around to other places or start their own businesses or do anything. Everybody's kind of locked into their, their current positions um, in part out of fear, um, in part because there's nothing else to move to. And so what the Fed tracks is their goal is to have this thing called involuntary unemployment, to have some level of unemployment in the world or in the country um, because that encourages people to move around to different jobs. And it, it, if we go back to this labor discipline model, it makes it so they are afraid of losing a job. If there are zero jobs out in the world and there is no unemployment, you actually have no risk of losing your job. Um, you can work as little as possible and you can't get fired because there's like 0% unemployment. You're just going to be working. 
And so the Fed's goal for um, unemployment here, like you need to have some level of unemployment um, to keep people working and to keep people shuffling around throughout jobs. And so the Fed's goal for that is somewhere between four and a half and six percent unemployment. Um, having something like two percent unemployment, um, politicians love it when that happens because they can say, look how low unemployment is. But from the, the standpoint of like economics, that's not great because it means people aren't moving out of their jobs. Um, if unemployment is like 10%, that's really bad because suddenly there's no jobs. Um, and so that that's too much unemployment. But generally you want kind of between four and a half and 6% unemployment is a good range according to the Federal Reserve. And again, it's good because of this labor discipline model where it it puts enough fear into workers essentially, which is kind of the, the economist's way of, of looking at why people are motivated. Um, in reality, people are motivated by lots of other things, not just fear, but at kind of the average level, fear works, I guess.